Hello there. Welcome into the Rocky Mountain Sports Room. I'm your host, Steve Wittett, joined today by my co-host, Ben Adams. And unfortunately, our third co-host, Nate Wood, he's a little under the weather today. He's not going to be talking with us, but he will be in future episodes. Looking forward to him being with us. So who are we? We're the Rocky Mountain Sports Room, and we are obsessed fans of the Colorado sports teams. We're going to be covering the Nuggets, the Avalanche, the Rockies, CU Buffs, CSU Rams, Air Force Falcons, DU Pioneers, and of course, everyone's most talked about team, the Denver Broncos. And that's where we're going to start off today. We're going to start off with, with talking about the 2023 offseason, running in through hiring of Sean Payton, going over free agencies, the draft, looking at training camp, and then recapping and kind of going through some of the things that happened during the 2023 season, bringing us up to date. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started and talk about the trade for Sean Payton. Um, the Broncos brought him in. They ended up trading a first round pick last year, which ended up being 29th overall and this year's 45, 45th overall pick. They gave him a contract of five years in the neighborhood of $18 million. Um, I believe that he was not Greg Penner's first choice to be head coach. Um, yeah, Steve, he, I agree with that. I think, I think there was a couple guys ahead of him, but, one thing that kind of rubbed me the wrong way initially with the hiring of Sean Payton is he wanted to stay through his few weeks left at Fox Sports through the Super Bowl. And you can argue that he slept on signing his coaching staff as he was one of the last coaches to fill out his staff. The Philadelphia Eagles, they had a reason to be, be looking at staff members after the Super Bowl because they lost their offensive and defensive coordinator. Sean Payton really didn't have any excuse. And the Philadelphia Eagles filled their defensive coordinator position before the Broncos did. Um, I find that to be la lazy. And Ben, I mean, what other options could we have had, not only in terms of head, co head coach, but also the coordinators? Well, I'm glad you asked, Steve, because there were quite a few pretty decent options, in my opinion. Uh, just a few that were interviewed, or uh, not interviewed, but uh, available out there, Matt Nagy, Kansas City Chiefs, uh, seemed to do pretty well. I know it's mostly Andy Reid, but nonetheless, he was out there. Kellen Moore, former uh, Dallas offensive coordinator, now with the Los Angeles Chargers. Uh, maybe not a great scheme fit for Sean Payton, uh, but nonetheless, a talented young coordinator. Todd Munkin from Bal went to Baltimore. Not much I have I know about him other than their offense looked Really pretty good. A lot of get a lot of that's Lamar Jackson. Well, but they had the number one rushing okay. offense this year, Ben. And yeah, Lamar Jackson really probably had his best season as a pro. We know he won the MVP a couple years ago, but he also won the MVP this year. So yeah, Todd Munkin would have been a great hire. Absolutely. Uh good point there. A guy we might that might sound familiar, Mike LaFleur, Matt LaFleur's brother, I believe. Los Angeles Rams. Uh, the turnaround they had this year. With Sean McVay, obviously, he's an offensive mastermind. But again, somebody has to run systems uh, in practice, you know, and stuff. So, and then one last one, just throwing it out there, former CU uh, guy, Eric Bieniemy, uh, former Kansas City offensive coordinator, I believe is with the Commanders now. He was with the Commanders last season. They actually just let him go, and he joined, oh, they... I believe, UCLA and their staff as OC. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, so so Sean Payton ends up with who? Joe Lombardi as the mm -hmm. offensive coordinator. Recently, Offense. he was fired from the Chargers, but he's a Sean Payton guy. So I think Sean Payton brought in someone he's familiar with, knows can probably install his game plans during the week, but he's going to be calling the plays. So he brings in someone really as just an assistant because this is Sean Payton's offense, and yeah. deservedly so. I mean, that's what the guy's known for um, for his 15-plus years as head coach and coordinator yeah. before that. Yeah, I'm sure it's a lot of the reason that he was hired here. Do uh, you want to hear about some defensive coordinators now? Uh, yes. Jim, Jim Schwartz, Cleveland. Mm. I don't know about you, but that defense was pretty ferocious. Uh, uh, definitely top five scared. this year. Yep. Uh guy named Mike McDonald, Baltimore. Again, he's just, you know, Baltimore seems to always find these coaches. Uh, fast risers. Their defense was solid. And, and Mike McDonald guy, just replaced uh, Pete Carroll out there in, in Seattle. So one year as oh, a coordinator wow. for Baltimore, yeah. now a head coach. I hadn't realized that. 
Uh, and one last one for you, Steve. A uh, guy I hadn't heard of before, Matt Burke. He's the mm. Houston Texans defensive coordinator. Took the Houston Texans from the 27th ranked uh, a defense allowed points per game in 2022. Turned them around all the way up to the 11th overall points per game allowed, 21.1 last year. Yeah, and all they did was go from having the number two overall pick to the second round, divisional round of the playoffs this year. That's it. So he would have been a great option, too. I'm not sure of the scheme fits that Sean Payton is looking for, but nonetheless, he was available. I mean, one thing we know for certain is they wanted to keep this Vic Fangio defense in place. They brought in Vance Joseph, the guy, um, and he kept Fangio's system in place, learned um, the nomenclature, and decided it was better for him to adjust as opposed to all the players since they were used to that. One other guy um, that was a real – option for the Broncos and we've heard him talk about it on the four letter network plenty of times this year former head coach and defensive coordinator Rex Ryan um I am under the belief that Rex Ryan is a very bombastic coach so you wonder if that would have worked um behind the scenes between Sean and Rex but we know he was commanding up upwards of five million dollars a season which is really steep for a coordinator position so we end up with Vance Joseph you know, and obviously had our ups and downs over the year. Um, one thing I'm really happy about, though, is the guy they brought in for special teams, Ben Kotwicka, because you look at the Broncos' special teams unit the last number of years, they've been abysmal, short of maybe, say, Brandon McMan McManus, who had, a, you know, a couple down years before he was let go by Sean Payton. But Ben Kotwicka really turned that that third of the, the team around, uh, made them more of a threat. We got a couple touchdowns out of Marvin Mims this year. He ends up making the Pro Bowl as a special teams player. So yep. I'll give him major props, Ben Kotlicka, special teams. I agree with you there. Uh, the special teams turnaround was noticeable. Right. Okay, so we've gone through the coaching search and, and where we landed. Um, let's talk a little bit about free agency. Um, Sean Payton, George Payton were very aggressive. They went out. The first move they made was a four-year, $52 million deal for guard Ben Powers. They also brought in Jared Stidham, quarterback, two years, $10 million. Uh, the big one, Mike McGlinchey, offensive tackle, right tackle oh. for the Broncos, five-year, $87.5 million, Ben. Chris Manhurts, two years, $6 million. Alex Singleton re-signed, three years, $18 million. They brought in a uh, big defensive lineman, Zach Allen, three years, $45.75 million. Brought in a third down specialist, running back Samaj P. Ryan, two years, seven and a half million. Fullback Michael Burton on a one year deal. Riley Dixon, punter, back on a two year deal. Uh, ben, who do you think of all these players actually worked out this year for the Broncos? Well, there's a couple of standouts, Steve. Alex Singleton led the team in tackles. He was really solid. I know the run game was definitely not the best area of the defense, but. He was able to rack up the tackles. Just ask anybody who uh, has an IDP position in fantasy football how many tackles he's getting per game. Uh, so he's a tackling machine. It's good signing, decent contract, you know, three years, 18 million, not completely break, ba breaking the bank for a linebacker. I also right. think. Right. Well, and that... you think about him too, like six million a year for an inside linebacker. That's not bad. It, no. Is he penetrating and, and getting a lot of stops behind the line of scrimmage? No. But he's cleaning up everything pretty much that comes through the middle, and that's how he's able to rack up those set, those tackle totals. Mm -hmm. So I think that was a great signing. But who else are you looking at? Well, we had we uh, you touched on Zach Allen. Uh, played better as the season went on, I thought. Maybe sl slow start, new system, or maybe he's getting used to a new team. Still a good signing. Three years, $45.75 million. He was our best defensive lineman last season, so somebody's got to get paid. I understand that he may not be an all-pro or a pro bowler, but, again, he was our best defensive lineman. So I think a pretty solid signing. He'll be he'll be around for at least, I think, next year. We'll see after that. Other than him, Samaj P. Ryan mm -hmm. was pretty impressive, in my opinion. Really great on third down. Uh, catching the ball out of the backfield, just a good addition, seemed to run hard. And uh, along with him, uh, the fullback Burton, uh, good to see a fullback back in the uh, mix uh, for the Broncos. I think they're going to need to rely heavy on that kind of power run game going forward. 
as we all kind of know the QB situation right now. So Right. Well, yeah, I mean, bringing back a legitimate fullback was something that the team hasn't had in a number of years. So, yeah, I agree with you. It was good to have that run blocking specialist in the backfield. And uh, I agree with you. P Ryan was a great third down specialist. I thought he brought a lot of juice off the bench. So Good if you look at what role he filled and how well he filled it and the price they got him, I think that was a great signing. Looking forward to having him back again next year. Um, but let's go ahead. I want to turn the focus to our offensive line free agents that we bought. Um, you know, it's been a revolving door at right tackle since Orlando Franklin. Um, yeah. left that spot in that Super Bowl yep. 50 year. He moved, if you remember that year, from tackle to guard. And it's just been a, a carousel since then. A lot of free agent signings that haven't worked out. Anyone they've drafted to play at that position has been a late round selection and hasn't worked out. They go out and they spend big money on Mike McGlinchey. Five years, $87.5 million. Talk was after he signed that deal, him his agent said no one else called and even offered anything that close. Um, he was a decent run blocker this year, but really left a lot to be desired in pass protection. Ben Powers, you know, at offensive guard, I thought he had a better year, but he was a turnstile over there, left guard in the pass, pass blocking aspect mm -hmm. as well. Not as Honestly, of the five guys, the two new guys getting all that big, shiny new money were the worst, in my opinion, out of the five. Yeah, I mean, you look at Garrett Bowles, he was solid. Lloyd Cushenberry's in line for a big deal. And then... Quinn Miners uh, out there just doing his thing. You know, he's, he was solid. So yeah. I would agree with that take, Steve. Steve, let's go ahead and talk about who hasn't worked out for free agent signings last season. First one on my list is Mike McGlinchey. Got the big contract. Just hasn't been good enough in the pass pro. Pretty good in the run game. It's kind of a road grader. Same goes for Ben Powers. Paying him pretty top dollar for the guard position. The Ravens still have the number one run offense without him, so that maybe says something there. He, he also gave up a lot of sacks, uh, left me wanting more in the run game, especially with the contract. Yeah, I mean, when you think about the Broncos starting offensive line in 2023, the two weak links were the two big money guys they signed in free agency. I thought Absolutely. Garrett Bowles um, had a very solid year again, maybe not Pro Bowl status, but that game against Cleveland, he shut down Miles Garrett. Mm -hmm. um, Lloyd Cushenberry, you know, had his struggles his first few years with the with the Broncos, but I think this new offensive line scheme, um, this power run game that Sean Payton brings has really fit him. He's probably going to be the top free agent center this year looking towards yep. – some people are estimating between 15 and $17 million a season. So, you know, with the current cap situation, it's highly unlikely he's coming back. And then Quinn Miners, easily our best – offensive lineman right now going into the last year of his deal coming up he's got to be a priority for them and let's just be real here right at right tackle it's been a revolving door since orlando franklin left the team after you know what was that 2015 mm -hmm. they've just had guy in guy out and anytime they've gone into free agency the guy hasn't worked out they've overpaid anytime they drafted someone at that position it's been late and it hasn't worked out and hasn't been just hasn't worked at all. And you think about offensive linemen, <clears throat> the good ones don't hit free agency. The good ones get re-signed by their teams. It's very rare we will see a tackle yeah. or a guard hit free agency if they're a good one. And then you always see every offseason there's guys dipping into that free agent market. Well, those guys hit the market for a reason. And until the Broncos figure this out, it's going to continue to be a problem. They have to address the offensive line in the draft. There's no other way around it. Maybe making a trade, that's it. But teams do not let the good ones go. I couldn't agree more. I think the route to take for any team that's going to be rebuilding as we're kind of facing down is to start with the inside out, start with that O-line. And it got to go through the draft. We've seen it. Many examples here in Denver about how they've tried to bring in guys like McGlinchey, let's just say, and it's just not working out. So, Steve, you're on to something there. Hoping to see at least two linemen drafted it this season. We'll get to that in the next uh, episode, uh, so I don't get to, into it too much. But I think you're on to something there. Well, yeah, you think about our tackles. We're paying our offensive tackles more than any other team in the league. And now we're just we're discussing maybe trade uh, relief, releasing Garrett Bowles 
and he's been, you know, a stalwart out there the last few years. Yeah. I mean, he had a couple rough years starting out. I think all of us were a little pissed off at the guy, but he's figured it out ever since, um, uh, you know, a few years ago when Fangio became the head mm-hmm. coach. Yeah. So, um, let's leave that there. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to take a look at the 2023 Broncos draft right here on the Rocky Mountain Sports Room. Welcome back here to the Rocky Mountain Sports Room. The 2023 Broncos season, off season. Right now, let's focus on the 2023 NFL draft. Broncos down a lot of picks from the Russell Wilson trade. Also, the Sean Payton trade where we saw us trade the 29th overall um, first round pick for Sean Payton. Um, that ended up, we netted that during that Bradley Chubb trade um, yep. from 2022. And then we're also giving up number 45 overall this upcoming draft. So we're missing out there. But um, we had no second round pick. Uh, Sean Payton, George Payton decided to make a trade with Kansas City, trade up into the second round at number 63 to draft Marvin Mims Jr., wide receiver. Um, they made a move up as well with Indianapolis um, to draft in the third round, number 67, middle linebacker Drew Sanders. Another third round pick, cornerback out of Iowa, number 83 overall, Riley Moss. Then they didn't pick until the sixth round. Um, they got safety J.L. Skinner, who was uh, part of the Malik Reed trade with the Steelers. So we got that oh, right. for him. And yep. then uh, number 257, seventh over, seventh round, um, Alex Forsyth center. Um, on paper, doesn't sound very good. Sports Illustrated recently came out and, and rated each draft class, and, and the Broncos were rated number 32 of 32. Um, my opinion is still a little too early to judge. These guys need a couple years to adjust, especially guys later down on the draft list, which the Broncos had some of. Um, and also Vance Joseph's known that he does not normally play rookies, but Ben, what do you see out of these players? What did, what did we get out of them in 2023? Well, the only player that I think we really got value on was Marvin Mims, the wide receiver. I made a couple good plays over the season. I had one real big play against Washington that I recall week two. Other than that, he's been <clears throat> or is a great special teams player. Went to the Pro Bowl, in fact, as a special teams player. Overall, though, he just needs to improve on his route running. You know how guys take the year one, year two leap. We're looking for that. Yeah, and he, could I mean, he really ran a lot of like nine routes, the deep ball. Mm-hmm. And otherwise, we didn't really see a lot of him and i don't know if that's it's a combination of russ not being able to find him out there um or him just not really run the routes well but that's what you keep hearing is he needs to improve that route running i'm with you there yeah hopefully, drew sanders? He, hopefully he can be some dynamic drew sanders on the other hand you know he played a little bit early on struggled down the stretch he was a little bit better but the thing with drew sanders right now is that they just are, have been decided to move him to an edge rusher as opposed to a middle linebacker. Now, the problem with that is why are we drafting a middle linebacker at that uh, Drew Sanders if we're going to move him to edge? You know, why not just draft an edge guy? So it kind of feels like a big miss to me. Well, yeah, and you think about it, we traded up for him. He was an early third-round pick, and this is a, a, a position that, the, that George Payton now has drafted twice, middle linebacker with Baron Browning and now Drew Sanders moving over to the edge. So – you know, yeah, they're rotational guys. At least we know Baron Browning is at this point. We'll see about Drew Sanders. We knew he was an edge rusher at Alabama. Um, you know, he was sitting behind uh, – who was it? Will uh, – guy who went to um, the Texans, Will Anderson oh, Jr. Will Anderson. Yeah, only the defensive rookie of the year this year for the Texans. Yeah. <laughs> um, he was behind him at Alabama, so he transferred to Arkansas. Had a really good senior year there, but, you know – he was drafted as a middle linebacker, as was Baron Browning, and they have not been able to to find a replacement there um, for Josie Jewell, which is what it's supposed what he's supposed to be. Right. So, uh, you see anything other else? Than that, other than that, Moss was hurt in camp. Uh, he really only played on special teams this season, and then uh, Skinner, you mentioned, special teams guy. Uh, maybe he starts to contribute year two. And Alex Forsythe, they didn't get any game action at all. So, you know, maybe yeah. he is the replacement for Lloyd Cushenberry. Well, I guess we'll go see. But 
seventh rounder, maybe the expectations are that he's <laughs> kind of valued where he was drafted and isn't that great. So, yeah, and I think we'll next episode. Again. Next episode, we're going to spend some time looking at George Payton draft history here with the Broncos. We'll spend a little time looking at Sean Payton's overall draft draft history, dating back to his days with the Saints. But let's face it, the last couple of years and this year, pretty rough. I mean, if yeah. all we get out of it is a return man as a second round pick, that's going to be that's not going to age very well, like some of those old yeah. way drafts that we're still looking at. Absolutely. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah. One last one last thing, Steve, before you move on. Anytime you're you're trading all your first round draft picks, second round draft picks for players and coaches. You're bound to have a lesser draft than say teams at the you know first half of the draft. Just as a side note, uh, maybe I'm sticking up for uh, George Payton a little bit. Well, yeah, I mean you get it. The draft cupboard was bare, but he brought that on himself. You know, he's the one that made <laughs> Very true. for us. Yeah. Um, we all know how that hasn't worked out. You know, we recently just left the team. We'll talk about that a little bit here at yep. the end of this episode. But um, yeah, the draft overall at the moment doesn't look very good. Doesn't look like we really got any kind of depth guys uh, moving forward. So that is still too early, like we talked about, to tell. I think these guys deserve a couple years um, to see if they're still on the team and can make any kind of headway on the roster. But um, let's leave that there. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, We're going to review the 2023 season, the lows, the highs, the in-betweens. What the hell were they thinking by not making any trades? We'll be right back. Welcome back here on the Rocky Mountain Sports Room. We're talking about the Broncos 2023 offseason and season. We left off uh, with the draft. Now we're picking up in training camp. Um, Sean Payton, he had a much different style in training camp than our, his predecessor, um, sure. Nathaniel Hackett starters played in every game. He had definitely more of an old school vibe. I don't know if you remember media members weren't allowed to talk to players during this time. Um, in the off season, he sat down with players. He said they need to become anonymous donors. He didn't want them posting workout videos, hyping themselves up, told Russ not to kiss babies. And right. then he comes out during training camp and this interview drops um, where he rips Nathaniel Hackett to shreds saying it's the worst coaching job he's seen in the history of the NFL. He's going to be pissed off if this team doesn't make the playoffs. He's doing exactly opposite of that anonymous donors attitude that he told his players to abide by. Now say what you will about Sean Payton. The guy rubs people, some people the wrong way. That's the way he is. He's not going to change. But I don't know that's the foot you want to start out with, telling people to be anonymous donors and then going out before the season even starts and just trash-talking the guy that was there before. Goes against the NFL coaching code, so to speak, but he did it anyways. I don't know if that was just a bloviate on himself, maybe pick up Russ a little bit, felt like he might be trying to do that. Maybe just shy some blame away from Russ and give more – to the organization and coaching staff from before, but left you scratching your head. To be honest, though, I was happy with what I saw in training camp, in the preseason games. The starters need to play. It's a war of attrition out there. They need to get their bodies ready. They need to get used to game action. You can't replicate that in practice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with a new, can't new hit system. everyone okay. on the field. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah you got a systems, whole new offensive system completely new different. Coach, new terminology. I'm very happy they went that route, and it probably did uh, help the season early on, even though the success wasn't there. Let's uh, let's quickly just mention there was a couple uh, trades for former Saints. Sean Payton, obviously the former head coach of the New Orleans Saints. They traded for Adam Troutman, tight end. Traded a pick number 257 for pick – uh, 195, but we also received Adam Troutman. Not much to be said there. He's a role player kind of guy, run blocker, tight end type. And then the one that's a real head scratcher, Steve, is the trade they made with the Saints for Will Lutz. We traded a seventh round pick to the Saints. It was looking like at the beginning of the season, the reports were that Will Lutz was going to be cut. So it's a real, it is a real head scratcher. Yeah, they they brought in a rookie kicker and they kept him over Will Lutz. So head yeah. scratching move to trade a draft pick for a kicker, where most of these guys aren't drafted. Maybe one every once in a while gets drafted, 
not that not every season does a guy get drafted. So why we're giving up a seventh round pick for him beyond me? Because like you said, it was very, very likely he was going to get cut. We could have just mm-hmm. brought him in and gave the yep. Saints nothing for it. Um, yeah, let's let's leave that there. Got those former Saints. I mean, let's talk now about the season and how it went. Yeah. Week one, home opener, Las Vegas Raiders. They lose 17 to 16. Uh, very frustrating game. You and I were at the game. We have season tickets. You were very incensed at the end of this one. Same old Broncos is what I kept hearing from you. Um, and let's face it, Sean Payton's new guy that he just traded a draft pick for left four points off the board. Yeah. The missed extra point and a missed field goal. The difference in that game being one point. Move on to the next week, week two, 35 33 loss to the Washington Commanders. We were at that game. I was incensed after this you one. Were. Yep. Uh, we were leading big in that game. Sam Howell came back, storming back, took the win. Uh, it was the start of the debacle that was the Miami Massacre in week three, losing 70-20 to 20 to the Miami Dolphins. Oh boy. Mike McDaniel came out, slapped Sean Payton around, slapped Vance Joseph around. The writing was on the wall after that commander's game. Yes, it was. And and Mike McDaniel came out and just he took he took his foot off the gas. That would have been the biggest blowout, the most points scored, the yep. most yards um, accumulated in a game. Mike McDaniel, thankfully, Smoky High, Smoky Hill graduate over here mm. in Aurora, took it easy on him. Took took the foot off the gas. But man, what a what a mess. I mean, I was so mad. I wanted them to leave Vance Joseph in Miami, make him fly southwest home. <laughs> I was there with you on that. Especially after that Commanders game where they blew such a big lead, I believe it was twenty-one to three uh, in the maybe early third quarter or late second half. Uh, I know the Commanders scored three unanswered. They uh, got two two scores right before half and a third right after half to really erase that big lead. So you're right; it was absolutely leading into that Dolphins game uh, with the defense struggling to say the least. I mean, 105 points given up in two weeks. Really bad, um, but huh. we'll move on. Everyone wanted Vance Joseph fired after that point. Sean Payton stuck with him. It seemed to be a good move as the season went on. I mean, and who are you going to get anyways at that point if you fire a guy in the middle of the year? Yeah. So, I we, mean, he, he he held on to him, you know, in, in retrospect, it ended up being fine because they didn't improve over the year. Uh, week four, Broncos finally get their first win. They play the Chicago Bears. They made a good comeback in that one, winning 31-28. to um, then bring it back to week five. <laughs> Nathaniel Hackett with his revenge game with the Jets. Zach Wilson probably had one of his best games of the year. 31 to 21 Jets. Really low point after that one. I mean, one and four going into and then to Kansas City, really putting up a dud on offense, losing 19 to eight. I mean, anytime you can hold the Chiefs to under 20, you got to find a way to score points. It felt like we had it, except the offense just couldn't do anything. Yeah, I couldn't do anything against that Chiefs defense, which did turn out to be one of the league's best, if not the best. They finished top five for sure. But yeah. I'm thinking at this point, we're one in five. Why the hell aren't we talking about tanking? What are we doing? Why are we paying all these old veterans when we can't compete? Mm-hmm. You know, this is the point in the season where we traded Randy Gregory. You know, we ended up getting a sixth round pick for him and a seventh. Um, we released Frank Clark. Uh, Kareem Jackson had started having his issues. He ended up missing, you know, about half the season for the Broncos. It was just a big mess. I, and I know you and Nate as well, were clamoring for them to tank because of how prosperous this group of quarterbacks coming out in the draft look. Yep. <laughs> Knowing that Russ isn't the guy. But let's go into the middle part of the season here. Sean Payton makes an adjustment on offense makes this a run first team. What did that win streak look like to you? Well, it all began at the a home game against the Packers. And I, I'm with you there at this point. I'm, I'm on the tank train. Uh, but the win against the, the Packers, 19 to 17, kind of turned the tides on the season. It absolutely did turn the tides on the season. The following game was back at home against the Chiefs. Finally, finally get that monkey off the back. 24 to 9, Broncos pull off a big win. I know that was the Mahomes quote flu game, 
but whatever, I will take it. To me, this is the highlight of the season. Wonderful to see us finally beat the Chiefs. Absolutely. So, at, at this point, I just want to ask you, Steve, after that Chiefs win, how are you feeling about the team? Do you, are you starting to believe, you know, the team's looking good. They took down the rival, two-game win streak. What are you thinking? I'm thinking trade the team. The trade deadline's two <laughs> days after that. I know we just got this big emotional win. But guess what? Yep. Sean Payton and George Payton are right there, too. Because the day after the Chiefs win, what do they do? They call Russ and say, hey, we need you to address your injury guarantee or else you're going to ride the bench. So let's face it. These guys were with us. They're saying, we're not good enough to compete this year. This guy is not competent enough to run the offense I want to run. I'm making adjustments right now to try and win some games, keep us in these games. But they needed to start trading some players. They left some players. They could have gotten some draft picks for that they sorely need. Because, again, this is one more draft. where We're down a second-round pick because of all these trades we've made for a QB and a coach. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on the train like... at this point. I'm ecstatic about that Chiefs win. First yeah. time they beat them since the Super Bowl year. And let's be real, they almost lost that first game that year. If it wasn't for a Jamal Charles fumble yep. with less than a minute left and a Bradley scoop, Bradley Roby scoop and score, we <laughs> yeah, lost that awesome. and it would have just compounded that. We got that win. We got this win this year. We beat them 24-9. to nine. <laughs> Anytime you can beat the eventual Super Bowl champ, I hated – "Quote unquote rival," hard to say they're a rival when they've been mm. beating the crap out of us for the last seven eight years. <laughs> Absolutely, but I was still on the let's tank, let's get a QB, let's address this roster. It's old; it doesn't have a lot of young talent because of all these trades we made that haven't worked out. That all makes sense, and like you said, the trade deadline came and went. Crickets there. No big moves of any sort. So the Broncos went on to go to face the Buffalo Bills. This set game was set up to be a slaughter, it looked like, on paper. Uh, but the Broncos coming off that win against the Chiefs, probably feeling real good about themselves, end up beating the Bills 24-22. The following week, uh, they beat the Vikings 21-20. Close game, but again, they beat the Vikings. And a great win, maybe a little under the radar win for the season was when the Broncos went to Cleveland and beat the Browns 29 to 12. Uh, that kind of capped off the five game win streak. The Browns game especially was impressive putting up 29 on that defense. And you had earlier mentioned how well Garrett Bowles played against Miles Garrett. Uh, so at that point, after the five game win streak, personally, I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, I think yeah, I that mean, playoffs are on the table at this point. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's um, looking good. It feels good. I mean, we got to let's talk about that win streak just a little more. There was a lot of luck involved. They averaged, they were averaging three to five turnovers a game during that streak, which is unattainable. Mm. But they yep. were running the ball, they were converting points on these turnovers. You know, that Bills game should have lost it, right? They should have lost it. Yes. Broncos go out there, kick a field goal, miss it, get a retry because they had 12 men on the field, make it. So we end up winning by two. That Vikings game, we dealt with Josh Dobbs, the pastronaut, who had an amazing two week run with his start mm -hmm. with the Vikings, um, barely edged them out. And like you alluded to, that Browns game, that was a great game. I think that's probably one of the best wins of the season in terms sure. of we beat a playoff team, we beat a team with on the road with a great defense. You know, I think at this point, there was no Deshaun Watson. So we were playing uh, uh, Thompson Robinson, I believe, started for in that game. Um, mm. But, you know, the offense came out and got 29 points. So, yeah, going into the quote-unquote start of the playoff run against the Texans, I think everyone in Broncos country is feeling themselves because we haven't had this in so long. This Absolutely. Time during the season, so everything's working. You know, in terms of getting wins, they're finding ways to win. It didn't seem sustainable. And they go in and they play the Houston Texans. It felt like Sean Payton at this point tried to revert back to running his offense. And I they agree. 22 to 17. It was a devastating loss. I felt like it took a lot of the momentum out of the team. But the week after, they turn around. And they play the Los, Los Angeles Chargers. Beat them 24 to 7. I don't know if you remember Justin Herbert. Went down early in this game. Yep, Their longtime did. backup, who had never played in the regular season, came in. So we got that 24-7 to win. Still kind of in the mix, right? 
Then they go to Detroit and get waxed, 42-17. to 17. So many missed opportunities in this game. Yeah. This is, of course, the infamous sideline blow-up of Sean Payton on Russ. Um, yeah, that was a, a uh, another like, game, much much like the Dolphins game, where you could just tell the speed, the the youth on the, the Lions versus what the Broncos had on the field. It wasn't even close. Goff threw five TD touchdown passes, and five touchdowns, three to Sam Laporta, a rookie tight end. It was just obvious who the better team was. And how was that for your fantasy team again? That was fantastic. I believe that was a semifinal playoff game. Goff got me there. All Let's right. say five touchdowns, man. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that was the game that uh, Sean Payton was screaming and yelling at Russell Wilson on the sideline. Came after they had failed uh, to convert it. They had gotten a touchdown uh, called back from a penalty. Quinn Miners got called for offensive offsides took off the touchdown, they settled for a field goal, and that's when the dramatics happened. Right. And at this point, really, they're on the outside looking in on those playoff hopes. You know, the Texans are, are piling up wins. We need some help, but we absolutely need to go into Christmas Eve against the New England Patriots at home and get a win. And what happens? Probably the worst, one of the worst losses of the year. Yeah, Losing brutal. the Holy Patriots 26-23, the big Bailey Zappi Came out yeah. there yeah. and they Grinch on the Broncos playoff hopes, <laughs> you know, and yeah, it was really ugly. So ugly that in fact, after, after that game that week, Sean Payton said he was looking for a spark on offense and benched a quarter of a billion dollar quarterback, which led to where we are today. They decide to go with Jarrett Stidham for the second time in two years. Jarrett Stidham comes in for a bench starter who's eventually to be released. We go up against the Chargers, and the, he's able to pull off a 16-9 to win. Broncos are already out of this at this point. doesn't really matter. And then they finish up the season with another loss to the Las Vegas Raiders, 24-17. Oh, how pissed off I am that for the last three or four years, the Raiders' offensive line, defensive line, pushes around the Broncos, and they got no answer to these guys. I think the, Bron the Broncos have a better roster. But this just goes to show, if you have an, a competent and, and stout offense and defensive line, you can beat poorly constructed teams like the Broncos. Yeah, and the Raiders just own the Broncos, swept on the season again for at least the third straight year. Yep. To wrap up the year. Yeah, I think we're at loss number seven in a row now. So okay. um, really rough. But, yeah. you know, what what do we think about this season? I mean, we finish eight and nine. It's the most wins we have since Gary Kubiak. Um, you know, three more wins than last year. Okay, steady improvement. Again, I feel like a lot of those wins were kind of lucky because you can't rely on those kind of turnovers game in game out to carry you through defensively. Yeah. When your offense struggles to score points, you're paying a guy at quarterback a quarter of a billion dollars, and he can't make the players around him better. That's why you pay these guys that kind of money. They're supposed to elevate the talent around them. You listen to the talking heads on ESPN, they're saying, oh, well, he doesn't have these good players around him. What happened with the Kansas City just a couple years ago? They trade Tyreek Hill because they expect their big money quarterback mm -hmm. to make up the difference. And what have they done since then? Won the Super Bowl twice. So – I don't want to hear it when it comes from the talking heads about how we didn't have enough to work around him. The guy couldn't master the offense. Yep. Sean Payton had to tr change everything to try and keep us in games because Russ just couldn't make the reads, couldn't make the throws. You know, he, he's great when protections break down and he's able to improvise, but under structure, making progressions, that is not his strong suit, and that's exactly what Sean Payton expects from his quarterback. It's no shock to me at all that Russell Wilson has now been cut. Yeah, it's all about rhythm and timing with Sean Payton's offense. Uh, when you watch Russell Wilson back there, he, he, he just never did work. Uh, too much scrambling when there's not pressure, too much holding onto the ball, and just not not the kind of guy he needs. Uh, my overall feeling about the season is that it was about what I expected, Steve. Uh, I really felt that Sean Payton would improve the team, and it, it was obvious he did. Things were more structured, more disciplined. There were some bad moments in the season, of course, but 
nothing like the Nathaniel Hackett clown show we saw the year before. Yeah, it was nice uh, having an adult in the room running the show. Yeah, it's a good way to put it. The one in five start was pretty brutal. It really did seem like a missed opportunity there for uh, to kind of look at the roster, see who could be moved, get in some draft capital, try to rebuild this thing. So that's a big takeaway is just the missed opportunity there to get some more uh, draft capital. But after the five-game win streak, Steve, I tell you, I was feeling pretty good. We, we kind of set out, you know, it's been a long time since we've ever even had a five-game win streak here in Broncos country. So it, Or had it, meaningful I mean, games in December, right? Yeah, absolutely. There hasn't been a meaningful game in December. So it felt really good as a fan to kind of get that feeling back, say, hey, we're in this. We've got a shot. We can at least make a push for the playoffs. But I do think that we all – Saw the writing on the wall in in it many ways. Cold. Yep, with the turnovers you mentioned, Russell Wilson down the stretch, that kind of debacle. Him and Trump Payton not on the same page. The late season losses then were predictable with uh, the QB situation. So overall, though, about what I expected, wanted them to make the playoffs, expected them to make the playoffs. Unfortunately, maybe that's this year. We'll uh, see it. Yeah, I mean, twenty twenty three disappointing. Um, but you know, we'll see, we'll, we'll look into our next episode about yeah. the off season plans, what they're planning to do real quick. Um, before we leave here today, just in the last few days, we got the official word that Russell Wilson has been released by the team. They're incurring an $85 million dead cap money over the next two seasons. It is going to seriously hamstring this team moving forward. Well, let's face it. This is a debacle on the biggest stage with the, most amount at risk. You gave up three players, oh. four premium draft picks. He did a pick swap later, a fourth for a fifth. And then he also threw in Drew Locke, Noah Fant, and Shelby Harris in the deal. Turn around, give him that $242.5 million extension before he played it a down. None of that's on Sean Payton. Okay, that's all George Payton all right. moved right there. He made that trade before the Walter Penner group came in. This debacle falls solely on Sean, uh, sorry, George Payton. Yep. But I believe wholeheartedly it was Sean Payton's decision to cut bait because he cannot have success with Russell Wilson as his quarterback. And that's just the fact of it. Um, it's disappointing as a fan seeing everything we gave up, but it is what it is. It's a business. It wasn't working out. It's better to cut your losses now and move forward, and try and find the right guy. Yeah, do it now, break ties, take the dead money over two years, try to get a guy in the draft. Uh, we'll talk about that in depth next episode. Yeah, so yeah, next episode, we're moving through this 2024 offseason, how the Broncos, we feel, what different options they might take with this offseason. They're going to do this kind of Band-Aid mentality that's been the approach since Super Bowl 50. Are they going to do a soft rebuild, a, a full rebuild? What does that look like? Who might we be looking at in free agency starting here really soon? A lot of things to talk about and then also moving to the draft. Um, before we leave here, I want to give a big thanks to the Lyric Lab based out of Loveland. They've been giving us the fresh tunes you're hearing in and out of our segments. You can contact them on Instagram, instagram.com slash the Lyric Lab. Be sure as you're moving forward, you stay in touch with us. We need your help producing the show. We want to hear from you. We want your comments. We want your suggestions. We want your questions. Email us at Rocky Mountain Sports Room at gmail.com. Be sure to like, follow, subscribe, share all of our platforms. We're on Facebook, Instagram, X, YouTube. You'll be finding us all those places, all the your favorite places to get your podcasts. Podcasts. So for Ben Adams, my co-host, Nate Wood behind the scenes. I'm Steve Wittett. Thanks for joining us here on the Rocky Mountain Sports Room. Look forward to seeing you. Next time, talking about 2024 offseason.